All right, it's November 27th, uh, 2021, and I'm back in my shop, and uh, I have an interesting project today, a little more unusual, I think, and that is to figure out how to display safely, aesthetically, and practically a piece of aviation history, or at least an aviation artifact, in my home office. What is that artifact? There it is. This is a section of the fuselage of a Boeing 747. It was one that was in service with Thai Airlines or Thai Airways, whatever their name was, and finally retired, uh, ended up in uh, I believe Mojave, California, at the large uh, boneyard they have there where planes are stored and often scrapped. And um, there's a number of companies such as Plane Tags and Moto Art that have figured out that people will buy this stuff. And uh, they cut a lot of old airplanes up, mostly the skin and then sell them as tags and on plaques and various things depending on what company it is. Plane Tags is certainly very popular. Uh, another company that does this kind of thing just cuts up fuselage sections of airliners and resells them and I just thought it was cool to have a piece of a 747 and I elected to buy this window section. Now it came with um, the tail number and other documentation so I know which airplane it was from and I found lots of good photos um, of this airplane, the airplane this came from online and uh, I thought it's not cosmetically that interesting but I'd still like to have it on the wall of my office along with a bunch of other aviation memorabilia I have in there. Um, it's certainly the biggest and heaviest. This weighs about 25 and a half pounds and that really makes you have a better understanding of how heavy these big airplanes are. Yeah, they, they fly, but they're heavy. If a little piece like this weighs 25 pounds and that's just the fuselage skin and a window, you can imagine how uh, much just the fuselage weighs, never mind fuel and engines and other heavy things. Anyway, um, this, the place I've mapped out for this is when I come into my office, because there's a closet ahead, you have to kind of jog to the right to get into the actual office from the doorway. And I used to have a bunch of other stuff, a couple posters on that facing wall when you first enter the door before you have to turn to the right. And I've cleared that of posters, I'll put those somewhere else, and that's about the right size for this. But I don't want to just have this. I also want to design whatever this goes on such that it will display a picture or two of the airplane. And I figured I would just put those right behind the glass here, or right behind the window. You know, probably one in the lower part and one in the upper part reproduce the photos I've got and frame them in some way that they appear fairly close behind the glass. Um, and I also have a couple of the actual plane tags. For example, I have a piece of Walter Saplata's B-36 that uh, plane tags cut up and I was able to get a piece of that and a couple other items uh, that I thought would kind of go in this whole thing as a single display. And since I might acquire additional plane tags, I had the idea of just putting a set of key hooks kind of maybe along the bottom of this. I don't want to have to put it behind them because then I'd have to remove this or open this every time I wanted to see those. So I figured they'll just hang down. Whatever I build for this will have an extension with some hooks on it and I can hang those as I acquire them. Uh, so it'll display the pictures, it'll display the artifact itself, it'll have a place for some additional small artifacts. And uh, also of primary importance to me is not this side, even though this is the pretty side. I want to show the other side and make it readily 
viewable. So here's the other side. Um, I think the structure is what's really fascinating about this. I knew that semi-monocoque aircraft structures, which is what almost all large airplanes use these days, relies on not a frame, but the strength is mostly in the skin supported by stringers. Uh, and everything's just riveted together, but most of the strength is in the skin, and so of course the skin isn't thin, but I don't know what this is, it's probably about an eighth of an inch or so thick, and it varies. It's thicker here than it is up here. Uh, it also has, and I think it's because it's in layers, it's kind of hard to see here, but you can almost see there's one separation here and one separation here, so this part here is another layer. I don't think it's welded or anything, I think it's just laid on there but held very tightly with all the rivets and, and other hardware. And then there's the, the stringer here, which is a kind of an extrusion like this, it looks like. And there's another one that lays on and makes a third layer. And then you've got this heavy piece, which is the window surround. And that's heavily bolted through with these, uh, I don't even know if they're rivets, but uh, they come through from the outside of the skin. There's a lot of them, as well as all these rivets here. And that has to do, I think, with metal fatigue. You've got a, an opening in the structural skin, and they learned from the example of the de Havilland Comet that a number of them started crashing that was you know an early jet airliner before you know Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and others had anything going yet uh, they found out that it was metal fatigue starting at the windows uh, so one thing that you want to do with those is make sure everything is rounded instead of having sharp corners and also have lots of reinforcement where it's needed so not only does this frame here it just helps support the window but it also strengthens the opening in the skin so that you don't get a metal fatigue issue in this area and uh, these guys that produce these just cut through I don't know if it's with big grinders I don't think it's like laser cut I think they just have big uh, grinders that they just chew through the skin and cut everything up anyway it's got the usual zinc chromate or whatever that um, coating is that they put on the insides of uh, uh, aluminum airplane parts. It's uh, I think an anti-corrosion paint first and foremost, but it has that distinctive green color. It's marked STR 22. I'm guessing STR might stand for stringer. Um, I'm just guessing, but then this one doesn't have a name, at least not marked in this position. There might have been one just off to the side. There are little bits of things like metal products, something or another, Cerritos, California. So presumably that's the subcontractor, subcontractor that made this particular casting um, for Boeing. And then you've got the actual window, and this is just the, the functional window. It has uh, all the clamps that hold it in. Of course, when the airplane's pressurized, and most of the time it's in use, air pressure is pushing on this. It doesn't really need those clips, but you need something to hold it in place the rest of the time. And then, of course, there's a cosmetic window on the inside of the um, plane. I think, I don't know if there's an additional one on the inside besides this, or if this is the whole thing. But certainly, the inside panel, the cosmetic panel that the passenger sees, has to get down to this somehow or there has to be yet another layer of window I'm not sure but anyway this is the functional window um, and uh, it's I think in two layers I think there's two panes there the inner one and the outer one and there's some sort of gasketing material squeezed in around there um, so anyway I want this side to be viewable uh, but I've decided it's not practical to put it on something where it's hinged outwards.
because to do that I would have to either build something very elaborate, which I don't care to do, uh, or I would have to modify it by drilling holes in it to mount hardware too, and I'm not going to in any way damage or alter this artifact. That's a primary concern and interest of mine. Um, so I figured I'm going to leave the sides open, so just looking at it sideways, and I can do that in the place where I'm going to be putting this, it'll be very easy to look at it from the side. It'll be easy to see the thickness of the skin, it'll be easy to see the stringers, it'll be easy to see some of the structure around here, and then if I actually want to remove it to display it better, it has to come off of whatever holds it to the wall um, very easily. But yet, since it weighs 25 and a half pounds, I don't want this thing falling off the wall. It needs to be secure that I don't have to worry about it falling and damaging anything that might be under it, or falling and hitting me as I walk by, that kind of thing. It needs to be strong enough and secure enough in its design that I don't have to worry about that. So this is uh, the part of my office that I'm talking about here. There's the uh, doorway in from the hallway, and uh, I won't comment on the decor here. It's um, I did not alter this room at all from the way it was when I bought the house about 30 years ago, and this was actually... Um, a family that lived here and the parents had a room and then there were two um, teenage girls I guess like middle school age at the time I bought the house from them they were middle school aged and they each had their own bedroom and um, the one of them had some very girly colored paint which I didn't care for so I painted over that but this room has paneling for a lot of it and it's sort of a floral pattern but it's fairly subdued so I've never uh, really objected to it and I've left it there. But anyway, when I walk into my office I've got this wall that then I have to swing sideways to uh, to get into the room. I won't really show that here but um, I figured out here that I need to mount this window assembly on a stud. And there is a stud here at the corner obviously. There's a stud here located with my stud finder and the next stud is way over here. It's not an even spacing, but that's where they seem to be. And also that's where the nails are that are securing this uh, paneling. Uh, I made a heavy mark here and another one here showing the width of the window. So that's about where it's going to go. And um, in order to swing the door, it's coming right over there. So I need to make sure I figured out that the latch down here is just a hair over four inches from the wall. So whatever I do needs to result in the window not being more than four inches out from the wall when it gets mounted. I also want to have it more or less straight ahead when I walk in, at least the window part of it. But I can mount it anywhere here. All the weight will be borne by uh, probably lag bolts into the stud. It'll go through the siding, or through the paneling, through the drywall, and then into the stud. And that can easily hold the 25 pounds, no worries there. Uh, so I'm probably going to have some sort of a plywood thing. I've got plenty of plywood. And that'll probably be about the same width as the window, although it doesn't have to be. It could be a little narrower. And then probably the whole height of the window, in order to have a piece hanging down that can... Um, support the bottom of the uh, the window because that's what's going to be bearing the weight. So I'm figuring out there's going to be some sort of trough along here into which the bottom lip or the bottom edge of the window assembly sets and then the top will also go into a trough that's downward facing. In order to get it in and out I could either slide it out sideways from the trough or probably easier if I make the top of the trough deeper than the trough on the bottom, then to put it in I actually engage the top part of the window assembly into its trough, but since it's deeper I can lift it up higher. That allows the bottom of the window assembly to swing in over its trough and then lower down into the trough, but lowering it 
because of the depth of the upper trough, the top will still be in the trough. So I think that'll work and then I can just grab the the edges of the, the window assembly and just lift it and then bring it out and do whatever I want to do with it. I can access the pictures that'll be mounted on the board here and um, however I decide to hang the plane tag things um, that can be down at the bottom but it'll have to be I think below the actual bottom of the window and the trough. So I know the width, I know that it's going to be center mounted, I know I'm going to use lag bolts into the stud um, to support the weight, and I know I'm going to use a trough system. So now I just have to work out the details. While I'm talking about some aviation memorabilia, I'm going to show a little bit of it that I have in my office. Here's a piece of fabric from one of the control surfaces of the Spruce Goose, the Hughes HK-1 flying boat. And uh, I was giving uh, some money to the Evergreen Air Venture Museum, or Aviation Museum, I think it's now the Evergreen Air and Space Museum, um, when they were trying to put together the building to put the, the Spruce Goose into, and they recovered all the flight surfaces um, with fresh fabric that was in the stores of what Hughes had set aside, so it was the appropriate fabric, and they just re, um, resurfaced the worn out surfaces, and they cut all the old stuff up. So I have a little piece cut out with a pinking shears or something. That's here, Certificate of Authenticity. So that's a little piece of the spruce goose that was on it when it flew. So I thought that was kind of cool. It's got a place of honor. And there's a picture of yours truly with a Howard Hughes hat on sitting at the controls of the Spruce Goose at the McMinnville Museum. And there's my signed picture of Jim Lovell. The one time I met him, got a signed picture. The time that I took a trip, an 11 hour trip on a genuine Zeppelin back when Airship Ventures was still operating one in California went up the California coast took all day certificate of doing that this is from the first time I flew on Fifi it's not a piece of Fifi it's just the first time I flew I got a certificate I didn't uh, keep the one from the second one I'm not even sure they gave me one probably did but this is from the first flight and uh, when I had an opportunity to fly on the first C-47 that flew into um, uh, Normandy on D-Day, that's All Brother, also owned by the CAF. I had a chance to fly on that, so I've got a certificate of that. And there's a bunch of other stuff like that, uh, but I won't bore you with the details. I just have a lot of this kind of stuff in the wall of my office. And... Hopefully the piece of a 747 will look good in their company. It looks like I've used up my stock of half-inch Baltic birch, but I still have half a sheet of uh, three-quarter inch Baltic birch. That may be overkill, but I don't really want to go out and buying a bunch of new wood to do this project. I'm just going to use what I've got. Um, so that'll be that. So I've sketched up what I think I'm going to do here. This is a front view. I'm going to have this piece of Baltic birch that's cut a little bit taller than the window section in order to have a part hanging out the bottom with some hooks for the, the plane tags. And otherwise I think it'll be the same dimension. So not a terribly big piece. Um, this is 18 inches wide by, what is it, a uh, little over two feet tall. Um, it's going to be anchored, I think, in three places just for safety to the stud with lag bolts and washers. Um, I'm going to have two, instead of making a continuous trough, which will be harder to fabricate, I'm just going to have a couple of cleats that have a trough-like profile and just two on the top to keep it from swinging out and then three on the bottom to better carry the weight although again two would probably be more than adequate three is just security 
I drew them off center here, but then this middle one will be centered. Um, and because the lag bolts will protrude, I can't mount photos right on that. So then I'm going to have another piece of thin plywood or something. Maybe it'll be masonite, it doesn't really matter. Whatever I have without buying a whole new sheet of wood uh, will go on a couple of rails or spacers to space it out so it clears the lag bolts. And then that'll be what I mount the photos on and any other documentation. Probably this certificate of authenticity and a couple other things can go down. But the part that aligns with the window will be a couple of photos here. And um, that'll probably be held in with just a couple of screws so that it can be removed in case I need to get at the leg bolts to remove this from the wall altogether. So looking at these cleats, this is kind of what I envisioned. If this slightly shaded area is the drywall, then you've got the uh, three-quarter inch plywood here. And, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong place. This is the three-quarter inch plywood here. And I show the lag bolts going through it, through the drywall into the studs, three places. And then this narrow strip of thinner wood that's just to hide the lag bolts and provide a flat surface on which to, um, to put the photos. And I may not make this that tall, but it should be tall enough at least to any reasonable angle you can look through the window. You don't see anything except for that piece of wood and whatever is mounted on it. It doesn't necessarily need to go all the way up or down. It just needs to be positioned such that it provides a backdrop to whatever you can see through the window. And it's going to be just, just behind whatever dimension I can put it out here that it's um, not going to hit these screws. These are the things that stick out the most. So it needs to clear that. I have to work out that dimension. And then there's the top cleat like this. It'll be held in probably with wood glue and screws. A long screw to go almost all the way through to the front and then a short screw. The bottom cleat will be the same way in reverse. So I'm figuring I'll cut out and again, these cleats will probably be made out of the three-quarter inch plywood, and I may double it up, kind of like I showed here, make a double thickness, just for good measure. And um, so the, the window section with its curve will sit down into the bottom trough, and then the top will be in the top trough, but there will be this extra depth here so I can lift the whole window up and in doing so the bottom will clear the lower trough and swing out and then the whole window can be lowered and then taken off of the assembly. So I just need to add up in great detail the actual dimensions I'm talking about here and make sure that nothing these cleats I think will still stand out more than anything else but I need to make sure that nothing sticks out more than four inches from the wall or if they do there's a chance part of the door will hit it when the door swings. I don't think that'll be a problem because right now I think it's only two inches maximum depth here and um, that should work out okay. It should even adding the three quarter inches of plywood I still have an inch and a quarter to play with and that should be more than enough to cover any ex Internal things that, or extra things that stick out a little further, like these little pieces of hardware here. Well, it looks like it actually sticks up about two and an eighth inches, and that's not because of the stringers. If it was the stringers, um, it would be two inches, but this one sticks up a little higher, and that's because hardware down in that area, window hardware, is uh, making it a little taller. So I need to figure, I need two and an eighth inches um, from the front of this to what it sits on, but it has to be more than that um, because I need to account for that extra thin piece of plywood or whatever that's holding the pictures, and those need to go over the likely 
head dimensions of the lag screws. So I need to work all of that out. And that'll dictate how big the cleats are at the ends. Okay, I've worked out the dimensions. I know that I'm going to have a piece of quarter, three quarter inch ball to birch, 34 by uh, 34 and 5 eighths inches by 18 inches, so it'll be the same width as the window section, and it'll be taller by the dimensions of the top and bottom cleats, plus an extra three and a half inches for the plain tags or any row of plain tags I put down below it. And within that, I'm going to have what I'm calling the picture frame, but it's not really a frame, it's going to be more like a a backboard or almost like a cork board um, onto which pictures can be tacked one way or the other, uh, removable adhesive or something. Probably I'm just going to use some spare uh, quarter inch masonite or even less than quarter inch, maybe um, whatever it is, eighth inch masonite um, to approximately 20 by 14 inches and that'll sit on pine board rails just made out of scrap to set it off so it covers up the lag bolt heads uh, that are mounting this whole thing to the wall. Um, so it performs two functions. It gives me something to put the pictures on and it covers up the hardware. Uh, I'm going to attach... I think I'm going to glue the masonite into rails with rabbit cuts in them so it covers up the edges of the masonite uh, from the side view mostly just to make it prettier. I don't think I'm going to have a top and bottom frame that's not that wide. And uh, I'm going to paint that. I'm going to put some primer on it and then some sort of a semi-gloss white, I think, paint. And then the pictures can be attached to that. It'll keep it nice and bright. Um, help reflect light around a little bit. Hopefully that'll be good. Uh, I'm going to make the cleats out of double layers of three-quarter inch Baltic birch, so inch and a half wide each cleat. Two on the top, three on the bottom, as I figured before. I've got my profile from my top cleat, except it's drawn. I ran out of paper, so it's actually a half inch taller than I drew it. Um, it has a cleat cutout in it, and again, picture this as being one and a half inches thick this way two layers of three-quarter inch plywood. And with the Baltic birch and all the high quality plies in it, that should make it plenty strong. But this side won't actually hold much weight. It'll hold weight of the uh, whole assembly trying to tip out that way, so I don't want to skimp too much. I don't want to make this area too thin. That's why it's an extra half inch taller. It's going to have a bit of a slope down just for cosmetic reasons. It'll be secured with uh, one and three-quarter inch screws coming in through the back of the backboard and into these it'll also be glued. Uh, on the bottom the cleat is a little more robust since it's carrying a lot more weight. I figured this will be enough uh, considering there's three of them and they're one and a half inches wide. Um, the, the cleat is shallower on here than it is on the top. Remember it'll just sit down here but on the top I have to be able to lift it up to get it to disengage the bottom cleat. Um, or the the the, um, the slot or the groove in the cleat. I'm calling this the cleat. This is the the notch in the cleat or whatever the proper term for that is. These will be this these bottom ones will be secured by either two inch or two and a quarter inch screws coming in through the backboard or the back plate. Um, and just because it's carrying a lot of weight. Even with those screws, just for good measure, I'm going to drill out one hole per cleat um, right about in the center of it. And I'm going to epoxy in a quarter inch metal rod, probably steel, whatever they have at the hardware store. Brass would work well enough, really, but it'll probably be steel. And uh, that's just to provide more strength this way. It's overkill. The screws alone would do it, the glue alone would do it, but with all that, what seems like a lot of weight, and these cleats not being very tall, I'd feel better if it has this in here. Um, so it's going to go most the length of the, or the depth of the cleat, 
Uh, I may actually go a bit further into it, just enough that it doesn't actually poke through the front. So it, it gives um, some extra shear strength to this assembly. I think all of that, since I'm not doing any calculations, this is all just squint my eyes calculations. I think that'll work. I have calculated that with the wall being here, That happens like clockwork just about once an hour because of my uh, drain, automatic drain valve on the tank. I wish I could set it to longer. I'd like to have it go off maybe once every three or four hours, but the timer only goes to one hour maximum between drains. So I have to live with that. When I'm elsewhere in the house, I can barely hear it, but down here it scares the pants off of me whenever it goes off. I'm never expecting it. Anyway, um, back to this. So I'm figuring a three inch, three inch long leg bolt or leg screw, uh, when we lose three quarters of an inch going through um, there, you still have two and a quarter inches into the stud. And this is the width of the stud, so it's going more than halfway into the stud. I think three of those should easily be able to handle the 25 pounds. Um, and, I've calculated I need 5 16 inches clearance to make sure I've got plenty of room for the leg screw heads and their washers and a little bit of slop. I'm assuming I'm using 3 quarter inch uh, wood for the, the, the picture here, but if it's masonite it may not actually be a quarter inch, it may actually be somewhat less than that. That's pretty thick for the masonite. But I don't want to go to the lumber yard and buy a sheet of quarter inch quality plywood just to get this little piece. Um, and the masonite has the advantage of having a smooth side already and it's not going to be carrying any weight so I think that'll be fine. Um, this will actually be narrower and that gives me even more clearance. Then you add the two and eighth inch um, total depth of the window. The whole assembly comes to three and a half inches out from the wall. I needed a maximum of four so that's good. It should actually be pretty easy to make. I'll just cut out a big piece of Baltic birch, then I'll cut out some small pieces, glue laminate them to make the cleats, then cut them out on the bandsaw using these paper things as templates. Um, do the necessary gluing and screwing to mount them to the back plate um, and uh, assemble the masonite thing and paint it. None of that should be a real big job. All right, there's my back plate or backboard, cut out and rough sanded. Still need to do a fine sanding on it. And I have this piece of scrap laid out for six bottom cleats and four. Still have to make a mark there. Four top cleats. All right, I've got all my little blocks cut out. And just to make sure they're big enough, I have to remember I have to add a half an inch to the top of this one. Looks like it's got more than enough. And for the bigger ones, plenty of room. And I'm going to use my uh, brad nailer to tack them together with uh, wood glue in between. And then for good measure, I'm going to put some clamps on them.
All right. You know, I decided to use some 3 16 inch thick masonite that I bought by accident. Might as well use it up. So I've got it marked for cutting here. And uh, I'll probably just do that on the table saw. Alright, there's that piece cut out. And now I've got some scrap pine from the last instrument case I made that this is just cut off of a larger stock that comes from the, the lumber yard. And I'm going to cut this down and make kind of a frame uh, out of it just to hide the sides. The top and bottom won't be very visible, but the sides will be. So I want to hide them with this. And also I need to offset it, like I said before, to get it up above the, uh, the level of the um, leg screw heads and washers. All right, I have my router table set up to make the rabbit cuts in these two strips. I'm still checking for depth, but I'm going to make a test cut. It's set a little shallow right now. All right, those pine strips have been cut with rabbit joints. And the idea is that the masonite will sit down into them like that and the top will be essentially flush. And here is one of the lag bolts I'm going to use, or lag screws, and it has more than enough clearance to go in there behind that, so that's good. And it seems like we got pretty good stiffness here without having any other support for that. It's a good thing I use the thicker masonite. All right, the masonite is glued into the strips and I've got clamps on them. It seems to be staying down pretty well, so I'm not gonna put any actual weight on it. This is not really a load-bearing glue joint anyway, just to generally hold the pieces together. Well, I think I can't do anything more for the day on this. I have to wait till tomorrow. Well, the glue is dried enough that I sanded the uh, masonite and pine assembly just to get the pine smooth and to a level even more or less with the smooth side of the masonite. And I'm going to hit it with uh, a can of paint and primer semi-gloss white. first coat all right my five uh, raw blocks for the cleats the glue is all dried I've set it up so the side with the uh, brad nails is gonna face towards the side I can't see them very well and I've got everything marked from the paper templates the up facing ones and the down facing ones now it's just a bit of work on the bandsaw.
I hit a nail there. I think it dulled my blade. Yeah, I managed to booger up the uh, blade. It's a fairly cheap blade, not carbide or anything like that. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't find a replacement blade in my collection. I found a couple ones from my old band, so which is kind of stupid, but uh, <laughs> um, I got this one here, which uh, is a, a high um, high tooth count blade that'll probably work. All right, <clears throat> I did find a uh, 18 TPI about zero kerf or whatever the word is. You can't cut curves with this. It's just for straight cutting, but that's all I have. Even though the uh, TPI is pretty fine for what I'm doing, at least I can get the job done while I order replacement blades. Well, uh, the better part of a day's delay turned into the great mouse hunt. <laughs> this is a 105 inch long blade and uh, uh, at least in the local retailers in my county nobody carries 105 inch blades. Um, it's very annoying that they don't. They all carry like the standard 93 and a half and some other sizes but not the 105. This saw normally takes a 93 and a half but because I have the riser kit on it to get more dimension this way it bumps it up to 105, so I had to go to Berlin's House of Tools, which is a bit of a drive for me, but at least they had the blade, nearly identical to the one I had, a uh, different brand, went from Lennox to Olsen, and we'll see how it does. I just have to avoid those, those brad nails. These carbon steel blades do really well. The other one was nearly three years old and working just fine until I hit that nail. It didn't take long to kill it, so um, let's see this time. Dodging some of the brads, I tried to lay it out so I wouldn't hit them, but a couple of them I got close enough as soon as I heard the blade start to touch it, I'd back off and try to cut around it. A couple of these need to be just broken off, and then I can sand them the rest of the way.
Okay, here are the cleats, the two top ones, the three bottom ones. And uh, I better do a fit check before proceeding. Okay, here's my test fit. The window is more or less aligned with the board, and it's not precisely cut out. You know, this is sort of a complex curve on the fuselage, so even if they used a square and cut straight down with a compound curve, depending how you look at it, it's not necessarily going to line up precisely. But I have my marks made on the top cleats, and with the window sitting in there like that, and these uh, notches are bigger than necessary because when I slide it to the left to disengage the bottom cleats, it needs to have extra clearance. But normally it'll rest somewhere in there, but it needs to have that extra half inch to move up. And these, are, uh, these top cleats are aligned with the top of the backboard. And all those guys are sitting in there very pretty. So at least that seems to fit. Now I have to see if my, um, my whiteboard will fit in there. Looks like it does, no problems there. The main thing I was worried about is not hitting there, and it looks like there's plenty of uh, clearance. I overcompensated a little bit, but that's fine. Now I also have to check and make sure I didn't somehow screw up and get more than four inches. And we're good by about uh, half an inch. So, so far that's looking good. I have no doubt that lifting is in that direction will disengage these and there's still plenty of clearance up here to slide it into and tilt it upwards to disengage the bottom here without binding on this excessively. And after I get it all together and on the wall, if it does hit there a little bit, I can go in here and kind of use a rasp or a uh, a sanding disc or something to open those up a little more but by my calculations that should be just about exactly the right amount of gap there okay good now I just have to pick exact locations for these cleats to go and by the way this extra strip down here is to put my hooks for the plane tags I've made marks for where I'm gonna mount the cleats I figured out where I'm going to mount the white panel corner marks. I've made a center line with three marks for where I'm going to drill the holes to go into the wall studs. And um, I was debating about how I'm going to best affix these here. Um, I definitely want to use glue in addition to the screws, but. I think it's going to be too hard to get these aligned. Um, I have to think about that a little bit. I might be able to clamp them in place and then do the pilot holes for the screws, then add the glue and then screw them together and thereby use the screws to clamp the glue. Or I can just put them in place with some glue and use clamps. And that'll probably be easier and uh, then put the screws in later. I'm kind of inclined towards that. And another revision. I've decided to use two screws on each of the upper cleats, two screws on each of the lower cleats, and um, what I've done is I've marked the locations of the holes. I'm going to drill a small pilot hole through from the top here, then I'm going to hold one of these in place one at a time, drill through from the back with the same pilot drill to get starter holes in here then I'll know where to uh, open those up and then I will use the screws to clamp the glue later on. Alright, I've dry mounted 
the cleats with the screws from the back. So those are on there and they seem to be in about their right places. Although for some reason some of these got canted a little bit to one side. I have no idea why that happened. Because when I drilled the pilot holes they were square. I really hate that. I'm not sure how to fix that right at this point. I don't want to remake the cleats. Huh. I'll have to contemplate that. Okay, that was just because I have enough slop on the clearance hole through this board that once I torqued them up it naturally torqued it in that direction and took a little bit off of square. So I can adjust for that once I'm getting ready to glue them up. All right, the cleats are on permanently, glued and screwed. As I thought, um, it was just a little bit of sloppiness due to the clearance hole, made it slightly oversized and that allowed the cleats to be torqued a little bit. So I just used my uh, channel locks. Once I got them snug down, then I just grabbed them and torqued them ever so slightly until they were true and square. I think I'm going to call it quits for the day. And tomorrow I have to run out and get the hardware to mount the white panel to this board. I bought some brass screws that I thought would thought it would do the trick, but that was for a different design and uh, I ended up making it thicker than I expected. So actually what I was originally going to do is glue the rails to this board and then put these screws in with these uh, decorative reinforcing washers through the masonite and I decided instead to glue the masonite to the rails and then screw the rails to the board. Um, I'm thinking at this point I will probably have to put those screws in from the front. If I put them in from the rear, then there's no way for me to attach it or detach it in order to get to the lag bolts that are going through here. So it has to be screwed in from the front. Unless I did something clever with metal. Always the most inopportune moment that thing kicks on. Thank you. I need to uh, just touch this up. There's a couple little paint bunnies on here that just are little pieces of dust or something that got paint on them. I can take those off with a like a scotch bright or something without having to repaint this. Anyway, so uh, I just need to get some slightly longer screws and uh, then I can put that on. I already have the leg bolts. I think I've got enough varnish. Uh, yeah, there may not be that much more to do. Another sanding, I think, after the first coat of varnish, but otherwise I think it's uh, coming together pretty well. Actually, I can do a sanity check here since everything is glued and screwed. All right, let's see if this thing has a hope of working. Put it in the top cleats, lift, swing the bottom in, lower it, ta-da! Lift, swing the bottom out, and it's out. I've decided that I do like the magnet approach and digging through my box of neodymium magnets I found six of a diameter that I think are probably pretty good considering the width of the rails. I can countersink those in there with a Forstner bit no problem and then put corresponding ones into here. I think I want three along each edge I have six of these it's perfect these are measuring at about 15 millimeters or just under 
so a 15 millimeter hole should be perfect for them. I just used my 15 millimeter Forstner bit to make a hole and try it a few times until I get the magnet to fit in there flush. All right, done with the Forstner bit. And by the way, this is the uh, box I made in another video for my metric Forstner bits. All right, let's see how that came out. There's the white frame. And I can just do my depth checks. And then, of course, I have uh, similar holes on the front of the backboard. Checking the depth on all those. Already did it actually, but that's how I like to do it. I just stick one of the magnets on a small screwdriver and that allows me to insert and remove them easily when I'm checking for depth during the drilling of the holes. Now here's the thing I always have to remind myself before I do these neodymium magnet mounting systems is there's a natural tendency to put them all north side up when you're gluing them in or vice versa. Uh, it's important to remember that the way it's going together this assembly here is this and this is the plywood back plate north and south attract so I've decided on on this assembly here north will be sticking up and south will go down in the hole on the plot on the heavy plywood backing south will be up and north will be down into the hole I mixed up a little bit of uh, two-part five-minute epoxy and I've got my six magnets in their holes now I have to do likewise for the um, the back plate making sure to have the south side facing up well if you noticed my error in the previous couple of steps good for you I didn't until it was too late that's what comes from working too late at night uh, and improvising uh, I had six magnets I need 12 there are six alignment points each needs two magnets actually I don't need them I could just glue in some washers or something but I don't have any washers so I'm going to use some smaller neodymium magnets which are darn nearly as strong they're just not quite as big in diameter and uh, I'll glue those in there and it'll be fine luckily it'll be covered up all right the neodymium magnets are now in the back plate a um, couple have drifted a little off center but it's not at all important I have sort of flooded the gap around them with epoxy I'll do a little bit of sanding in the morning make those nice and smooth and uh, then I gotta drill these holes do a final sanding, do some varnishing, put in the uh, hooks here for the plane tags, and uh, that'll be nearly done. Oh yeah, I still have to do a light sanding and one coat of additional paint on the, on the whiteboard. Although I don't have anything being painted or varnished at the moment, I found that this JR Weld epoxy that I'm trying to use up seems to need to be a lot warmer to cure properly so just uh, to make sure that it cures by tomorrow I'm elevating the temperature in the area to about 72 degrees with a couple of uh, fan heaters all right let's see how this works on there pretty well. I can't even knock it aside even if I... you really have to hit it hard to dislodge it and it kind of self-centers itself. So I think that works pretty well. Based on the way this ended up coming together I don't feel any need for the reinforcing steel rod into these parts, into these cleats here so it goes in my pile of dowels and rods. 
this is ready for uh, varnishing except I think I should probably put the hooks on it first I trace the outline of the back plate or backboard here onto a piece of craft paper and um, I don't know if this will show it also marked the locations of the three mounting holes and marked where the actual window is so when I put it on the wall and figure out exactly where I'm going to mount it this is a lot easier to hold up than the whole assembly and then I can get my holes drilled while the varnish is drying okay I'm ready to start varnishing and I've got some Minwax clear semi-gloss varnish in my uh, ball jars got my Bloxygen for resealing it, got my stirrer and my disposable foam brush and uh, got to stir this up, decant a little bit into here and then get going with it okay first coat of varnish is on and uh, I have to go and play a gig so um, I can't sit around here and supervise the heater fans so they're just on fan mode I don't let these things run when I'm not at home so uh, hopefully I'll be able to give it another coat when I get home if not I'll have to turn the heaters on for a while okay same day evening second coat on after a light sanding and uh, the two heater fans going in heater mode this time I think I'll go upstairs and place the template and drill the holes in the walls for the uh, three lag bolts and then there's nothing to do until tomorrow alright I've got my template taped up on the wall and I used a bubble level to make sure it was vertical or straight up and true I've decided this is a good position for the window to be here and uh, the place on my blue tape I'd marked as the center line of the stud hopefully it's pretty close to there at least according to the stud finder so I've got a line through my three mounting hole locations and that's lined up with the center of the stud and it also aligns with the side markings I'd estimated before so I should be able to go through and drill a test hole and make sure it goes into something it doesn't have to be dead nuts in the center of the stud all right the stud finder lied I found nothing but empty space here I went over to here and I got into solid wood so um, that should be a safe place to drill for real. I just have to realign my template. I'm using a nut driver in my drill to drive it in there. Okay, the backboard is mounted to the wall. Three places. I double checked it with a bubble level and it's all square um, now to hang the I still don't know what to call it the photo support plate or something like that oops there we go self centers self locates So the desired cross section is easily visible here from the office, which is what I wanted. Doesn't look too shabby. But 
There's not a ton of light coming through from the front, but um, I'm thinking about possibly putting a battery operated light up above the doorway that I can flick on when I want to illuminate this area a little better. But that's sort of a thing I'll deal with later. Anyway, I did hang my whole weight from the top two cleats, so there's absolutely plenty of strength here. No doubt this thing is going to stay up there until I decide to take it down, but it is very easily removed for further inspection. I have two pictures that I've chosen of this same 747 in flight. I'm not showing them too long because I haven't yet obtained permission to use them. I mean, I can use them any way I want, but to put them back up on YouTube as part of this video, um, I don't want to have them displayed more than incidentally until I've been able to get permission from the photographers. I have asked, but they haven't responded yet, so I'm trying to, for the moment, just flash past them. So, um, I've made this, in my desktop publisher, I've made this little um, informational card that will go on the photo display panel. Yet another name for it. So, uh, the registration number or the serial number of this uh, aircraft is 27093. The tail number was HS-TGM sometimes misreported as T6M, uh, had a 64.44 meter wingspan, a 70.67 meter length, a uh, height of 19.41 meters. I may change that to feet. I'm not sure. Uh, apparently this one was only fitted with 375 seats, although the type could uh, have uh, upwards I think of 450 seats or 430 seats or something like that. So this may have been a slightly more luxurious cabin layout with more business class or first class seats. And the plane had a name which I won't hazard to pronounce. Shao Freya? I don't know. I don't even know what language that's in. I tried putting that into uh, Google Translate and it couldn't detect the language and I tried Thai and Chinese and several things and it didn't translate as anything. So maybe it's a proper name, I don't know. Um, so it's a 747-400 HSTGM. It was delivered in November of 1992 and flew exclusively in the Thai Airways fleet for 21 years. It uh, took on intercontinental flights to key destinations I know that it appeared in many airports around the world during its career. It was part of a key fleet that elevated Thai Airways to one of the top airlines in Asia. The airline's motto is the first choice carrier with touches of Thai, representing Thai culture, customs, and traditions through quality service, unique onboard catering, and a friendly welcome unlike any other. <clears throat> a true jewel of the sky, Thai Airways' radiant purple livery remains a favorite of spotters all over the world. The plane retired in December of 2013 and was flown to Mojave. I misspelled that it's Mojave with a J. Fix that right now. Well, I didn't misspell it. I copied that from somewhere else. They misspelled it. Now it's fixed. Uh, to Mojave, California to be scrapped. Uh, a lot of the plane was cut up by Moto Art in other words, plane tags. And I have a tag from the tail of the same airplane. I've just temporarily misplaced it. I know I've seen it around my house. When I find it, I'll hang it on the, uh, the display. The fuselage section I got came from uh, Wild Art. Wildy Art. The guy's name is Wildy or Wild and he is the one who cut out the big fuselage sections of which I bought the one. Um, 
blah 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 blah. So I just uh, noted the disparity in the T6M and the TGM. Uh, because it's all white and it came from the later livery, uh, it's hard to tell where it is because the majority window is on the plane in its later livery. Uh, we're all just white around them, so you can't tell by the color, except you know it's not by the tail because that would have been magenta or yellow or some other color. Um, but due to the fair amount of curvature, I'm guessing it might have come either from the, the upper deck or from closer to the nose where there would be more curvature to the fuselage. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Unless you think I'm just super lazy. I have a couple of friends, well, yeah, three, almost four friends. <laughs> Different people in the aviation industry, commercial aviation, a couple of active and a couple of retired uh, pilots that all flew the 747 at various points in their career. And uh, I've asked each of them to see if they could still contact anybody they knew in their airline maintenance department and ask about the serial number and the stringer number which is stenciled on the inside of this section because that would help identify where the window section came from but none of them were able to get uh, that information for me. And I printed the sheet on some now discontinued 3M print to last paper so it'll be dimensionally stable when I stick it up on the board it shouldn't wrinkle. Again, I'm taking these obliquely since I haven't received permission to use these pictures in a video yet. Okay, for my um, informational sheet that I printed out, I'm going to try to attach this to the white backboard with repositionable, non-permanent adhesive, but still something with a lot more tack. I have... Uh, these normal dispensers of repositionable adhesive that it basically puts down the same kind and thickness of adhesive as say a post-it note uses. Those are great but I don't picture it having quite enough uh, strength for this application. It may well fall off uh, so I have a couple pieces of scrap paper here. I'm going to do a test and I bought this product here, glue dots, repositionable. And um, what they are is just a string of, let's see if I can get this thing to focus, little globs of glue, um, what Wikipedia refers to as gummy glue or booger blue or just snot drops. Supposedly those are very common terms for this stuff. It's basically the same adhesive you get if you get, for example, a credit card or something like that in the mail and it comes attached to some paper that you have to peel it off and then the adhesive is just this kind of, well, boogery <laughs> uh, material that's left and you can kind of roll it off with your thumb and throw it in the trash. This seems to be basically the same kind of adhesive. So it should be pretty ideal for this. Um, apparently there's a little bit of a trick to it so you don't apply one and a half dots or something. You're supposed to hold it at a 45 degree angle thereabouts and roll it till you feel it roll off the glue glob. It makes a little bump in the applicator. So I've got three glue globs there. I think they can show up in the camera. I'm going to stick another piece of paper on there. And um, they're on there pretty good, but they do let loose. And I can roll them off. With my thumb and completely remove them from the um, from whatever they were on, you can see why they get the name. So I'm going to apply this product to the corners.
And I found if you have the angle wrong, it doesn't make the same sensation to let you know that you've actually applied the entire glob of glue. It seems to work best at about 45 degrees. I don't think I'm going to do anything except for those corners. Let's see how well I can do this. It looks pretty straight. All right, there it goes. Okay, the next day I got my wireless ultra-thin LED light bar by Brilliant Evolution, bought on Amazon for a few dollars. It's just around 100 hours on batteries. This is one of the very few I could find that was battery-powered didn't require USB power or an AC adapter and was not motion sensitive because I figured it would drive me nuts if it was motion sensitive. Um, I just wanted something I could turn on occasionally and um, <clears throat> it says on off tap lens so I guess you tap the lens to turn it on and off. Mount with screws or adhesive tape both included. It's supposed to be 65 lumens. I have no idea off the top of my head how bright that is relative to anything else. Uh, it's a 300, 3000 Kelvin color temperature, which is a warm white. Three AA cells, four LEDs. Let's see how it goes. Okay, three AA cells are in there. It does come with a couple of screws that were tucked into the battery compartment. And um, this just sits down there and then slides forward and it's closed. So I think you have to mount it this side up so that uh, otherwise the assembly could slide off. If you mounted it the other way around, it could the back could slide up just from the with the weight of the thing. So I think you have to mount it with the LED side down. And it has these 3M, I don't know if they're actually 3M or just ripped off 3M, but double-sided foam adhesive pads. I have to make sure this thing's going to fit on the door frame. Okay, there it is above my doorway. It's not super bright. Let's see what kind of illumination improvement it gives for the window here. Well, it's enough. All right, I think that's successful. End of project. I still haven't found my uh, plane tag for the uh, for the tail of this airplane, but I know I've seen it recently. It's around. It's not lost. It's just not where I'm thinking it is. So I found my much sought after piece of tail from the 747. Confirms it's from the same um, tail number. Looks like they, what they do, um, made 10,000 of these tags from pieces of the tail. I don't know if that, I guess that's true. <laughs> Anyway, so it has the original purple paint on it, and then they laser etch on the pattern. And the other side, it's just um, because you you can use these with your keys and so on. They have um, you know places to write contact information if lost and all that good stuff. All right, gets hung on there along with my piece of my Walter Supplata B36. If I acquire any more of these, I've got a couple more hooks to put them. And I could always add a couple more hooks outboard if I need to.